right, we're going to get started for the sake of time. We have a great presenter today. So I apologize, I have a little bit of a cold. So if my voice sounds manly, then I apologize. Uh, welcome to Purdue at Westgate first Tuesday event. Looks like a great crowd here. We really appreciate you coming tonight. And even if you stayed over from the Connected Mission, that was a great event as well, uh, having a briefing from NSWC. The first Tuesday of each month, we try to design an opportunity for industry, academia, and government innovators to converge, share knowledge, develop networks, and have discovery opportunities. You may, you may have remember or have seen that on Tuesday, September 5th, the officials of Purdue University, Purdue Applied Research Institute, Perry, and the Purdue Research Foundation announced a permanent presence in elevating the partnership with NSWC Crane Division. Even though one of the initial focus will be on trusted microelectronics, other focuses will be hypersonics and energetic materials. Today, we are super excited to have Steve Bowden, the founding director at the Purdue Energetics Research Center, here to help us explore innovations in energetic materials research. Steve is a professor in the Davison School of Chemical Engineering at Purdue University. He is known for his work on powder and particle adhesion and has published more than 100 manuscript in the referred literature and made more than 200 technical presentations in this area. Before we get started, I want to let you know that a recording of this event as well as the slide presentation will be sent to all of the people that have registered. So if you have not RSVP'd, please let one of us know uh, and we'll, we'll get you that information. And by the way, my name is Samantha Nelson. I probably didn't introduce myself. I'm the program manager here at Purdue at Westgate along with Morgan Tavis, who is our marketing manager. So we really appreciate you coming. Um, we would also like to thank and give a huge thank you to Lidos for sponsoring this event. So they'll be sponsoring the networking event that will be happening after this in the lobby with refreshments and some light beverages. So with no further ado, I would like to introduce to you Professor Steve Bowden. All right, I don't usually talk into a microphone, but for the purpose of recording, I'm going to try. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you very much. I'm impressed and really excited that so many of you have come out. I've got a presentation here that will give you a high level, but hopefully very interesting overview of all of the capabilities at the Purdue Energetics Research Center. Um, I am the founding director. Uh, we've been a center. I'm going to need you to advance those for me. Actually, I can do it myself. I'm a grown-up. I'm a grown-up. I got it. All right. Um, so uh, we've been a center for six years, seven years. And in that time, we've grown from having roughly $20 million worth of open research contracts at any given time to having now more than $90 million worth of open research contracts at any time. Uh, we occupy uh, eight buildings on campus. Uh, we have more than 140 clearable people working on energet energetic materials at any given time. Uh, and we uh, primarily, you will find us here in Bowen Lab doing high rate mechanics, uh, studies of impact of uh, yeah, very high speed impact against energetic materials. Uh, in mechanical engineering in Armstrong Hall doing a lot of laser diagnostic work, which I will show you. In Zucro Labs is where we make things go boom or we work with things that might go boom. Uh, in Herrick Labs, we do a lot of 3D printing of energetic materials. I'll show you some of that. In the Flex Lab, we do a lot of synthesis of new energetic molecules. I'll show you some of that. Uh, Weatherill also, we do some synthesis of energetics, uh, primarily uh, hypergols there. Um, and then over here in Forney is where I work with the atomic force microscope. It's also where we do continuous crystallization of energetic materials. So we study adhesion and processing and formulation. Thank you. Thank you. That's far away from you. You got it? Oh, okay. Thank you. All right. So the complete spectrum of what we do is here. We work, our theme is molecules to manufacturing. Okay. So we start off, and, and what I'm going to talk about here is both the computational work as well as the experimental work. So we design new molecules in silico, we design new types of crystals in silico, and then we go ahead and synthesize the most promising, the most energetic, and the most apparently stable and insensitive of the types that we have identified computationally. We then take that work and we fabricate new methods, 3D printing methods, new mixing methods, and other ways to make new formulations with the new molecules 
or new formulations with existing molecules, or old formulations where we just do drop-in substitution of the new species into the old. We'll do work on modeling of the behavior of the energetic materials at the single molecule scale, at the crystal scale, and at the formulation scale. And so that modeling spans nine orders of magnitude uh, from angstrom scale phenomena all the way up to the, the phenomena of something inside an artillery shell, for example. Uh, we do carrot, whoops, now it works. What did you do? Thank you, all right. Now I can be self-sufficient here, I feel much better. All right. Uh, we do optical diagnostic work on post-detonation fireballs. If you want to engineer a fireball so the energy goes where you want it or so that the solids created by a fireball go where you want them, you have to know what's going on inside the fireball. So we do a lot of work in characterizing fireballs. I'll show you some of that. Uh, we do work on high rate mechanics. I will show you some of this kind of a work because uh, we want to understand if you want to uh, strike a target and you want to penetrate below the surface of the ground, for example, before something interesting happens, you have to understand the way that your material is going to behave through that very high rate impact so that you can engineer the materials to survive the impact. I'll show you some of that work today. Um, and then the last bit of work we're getting into here has to do with manufacturing. We do work on additive manufacturing of materials so we can make novel structures that will have novel properties inside of a missile, for example, inside of a rocket interesting kinds of detonators, ways to implant sensors, ways to implant actuators and heaters inside rocket motors, for example. I'll show you a little bit of that. And then we're now moving into bulk manufacturing of energetic materials. We've been asked, I was just summarizing it today uh, during, on a call on my way down, seven different molecules that are in the critical chemicals list uh, for, the, for the DOD through the uh, MSEP office. We've been asked to do continuous synthesis, formulation, and purification of those molecules uh, in partnership with industry and government. I'll show you a little bit of that work as well. And you should ask me questions at any point in time. That makes this more fun. Uh, so please uh, stop me, ask questions, whatever seems interesting. It'll, more of a discussion is more, more fun for all of us. Okay, this summarizes everything that we do on one slide. So I could stop right after this. Uh, I will not, but I could. And then you'd, you'd know enough to just go out and enjoy a beverage. Uh, so if you start here at the bottom, these are all of the different ways that we model the behaviors of energetic material. Right? So over here, we're talking about modeling where is energy released at certain wavelengths during bond making and bond breaking. We can move from understanding the behavior of individual molecules to doing some coarse grained work to understand how does a void, how, does, how is energy generated in a void when there's a high rate impact on an energetic material? So now we're moving up from the, sing, from the angstrom and nanometer scale up to the micron scale, because we want to understand when we launch a rocket and the energetic material inside stays behind and the, sh the casing wants to move, just like your stomach on the roller coaster, how does that cause the energetic material to shear and how does that then lead to the material falling apart? or the material detonating early, or the material deflagrating and burning out on us. So we want to understand that behavior at the micron scale. Then we move from this micron scale phenomena here, and these are picosca picosecond uh, resolution uh, simulations, up to the behavior when we have a high rate impact. These are stress distributions along the edges of energetic crystals inside rubbery binder during impact. And then we can move from individual crystals all the way up to the behavior of a compact the gray here is HMX, the blue stuff is the, is the binder that's holding that together, and that's sort of representing what might be inside a rocket motor, for example. So we're describing the behavior from the atomic scale all the way up to the behavior of something you know, large enough you could hold it in your hand. And all of those models are integrated all over all those length scales. So you have to know that the models are right, and so you have to find ways to insult energetic materials and get them to respond so you can see if the responses are what you expect. If they are, then your model is accurate, right? So these are the different ways that we can insult or irritate the energetic materials. We use lasers to provide shocks. We use lasers to heat materials up. We can do some vibration work. We have shaker tables and we can in impart acoustic energy and cause the materials to vibrate. And then we can go up to the Kolsky bar gar bars and the gas guns and we can do the high rate impact studies and look at how material behaves uh, under the uh, impact with the building, for example. So all of these different techniques we use to insult the energetic materials, and then we have to measure the response. We do that with a variety of different spectroscopies, electron microscopy work. This is some work where we actually put energetic material in the synchrotron up at Argonne, 
and we hit it with a gas gun, okay, and then we measured the behavior of the energetic material as it deflagrated or as it, uh, in some cases, melted under that high rate impact in the x-rays at the synchrotron. And then all the way up here, this is thermography of, the, of continuous material, just using thermal cameras and looking where heat's generated as an impact or, or stress is applied to an energetic material. Okay. So the point is experimental work integrated with modeling work over nine orders of magnitude to fully understand the behavior of the energetic materials we use. Yes, question. So the question is, is the market for this work purely defense or do other, others value it? That NASA has quite a bit of interest uh, because they want the better propellants for better, uh, better space flight. Um, primarily beyond that, it is defense related work. Okay. There are some mining companies, for example, that want to come and they want to engineer materials. They want to be able to direct blast, direct energy. Uh, but for the most part, the, the majority of our funding is uh, from DOD, DOE, and then NASA. Other questions? Thank you for the question. All right. Uh, so here's some of the synthesis work that we're doing. Uh, anybody here, a synthesis chemist, works with synthesizing energetics? No, okay. All right, good. I can tell you anything right now and it sounds great. All right, so um, this is the name of the game these days, okay? What you wanna do is you wanna make these polyannulated heterocyclic structures. Polyannulated annulus is ring. Uh, and so we want rings stuck onto rings, stuck onto rings. Lots of strain energy inside there. Lots of energy associated with making and breaking those bonds. So when you can hang these molecules together with many rings all attached to each other, that's much more energetic than if those rings are separated by chains of hydrocarbons. You want to put as much nitrogen as possible inside. The nitrogen bonds are much higher energy bonds than carbon-hydrogen and carbon-carbon bonds. So more energy is released upon the, the combustion or the, the, when the molecule falls apart. And then you want to put these interesting uh, heterostructures on the ends because those are other ways that you're going to store energy when you create the molecule. This one right here was the most energetic molecule ever made when it was made. And that was Davin Piercy in our, on our team helped make that molecule. Uh, that was at Ludwig Maximilians about 10 years ago. That's TKW50. Uh, it's not useful. It's too uh, sensitive to be useful in any of the applications we might see out here at Crane. Uh, but it, it was, at the time it was made, the most energetic molecule made. Uh, once we make these molecules, we're going to collect them as crystals, and then we're going to characterize their behavior. Here's a witness plate where we detonate a small amount, and we look at you know, the ability to put a hole through the stainless steel like that. Uh, we should not have done this but it was fun, um, and just sort of let the material sort of burn up outside, a pyrotechnic application there. Uh, then we measure burn rate, and we look at the sensitivity of the molecule as we apply friction, as we apply stress, impact, electrical shock. Uh, all of those are gonna cause the material to detonate or not, and we characterize the material after we make it. So these are some of the molecules that we're making right now. Uh, these are new molecules, and the game here is to find molecules that are better than RDX. RDX is sort of the standard, right? So you want to be RDX plus. Okay. Uh, this, you can have the slides if you'd like uh, later on. Um, and so here is uh, RDX, okay? And you can see its molecular weight. This is the decomposition temperature. That's important. You want your decomposition temperature to be very high like that because these are going to get warm when they fly through the air at high rates of speed. They're going to be on the back of trucks going across Arizona. You're going to have to process them. You're going to have to melt them. You're going to have to put them inside an artillery shell. And so you can't have this stuff fall apart uh, at, uh, at low temperatures. You have to have a high melting materials, right? So this is the decomposition temperature. This is when the molecule decomposes. We want to be up here around RDX temperature. Uh, this is the density. You need dense materials because you want a lot of energy density. Okay? And so the more dense material, the more energy you can get in a certain amount of space, and the more excitement you can deliver uh, when you arrive on target. And then down here is detonation velocity. This is the way that when the material detonates, this is the rate at which the energy is liberated. Right? You want a big number there. So this datto molecule over here is one that we have made. It's a new molecule. Um, the decomposition temperature is too low, unfortunately. But the detonation velocity is phenomenal, and uh, density is more than fine. 
Um, so this would be an excellent replacement for RDX, but we failed because it's too low decomposition temperature. Okay? So back to the drawing board, we're making more molecules that look like this one. Okay? In an ideal world, you're only going to have two or three steps from raw materials to your final energetic species. If you have too many steps, any step in the middle, there's a possibility that you're going to make something that's unstable and now you don't have a molecule that you can make at scale uh, for an energetics application. So we want a two or three step, maybe four step syntheses. Yeah, John. What's the volume of these units of testing? Uh, we'll use milligram quantities for most of the testing that we do. Yeah, you can get all the information you want out of five milligrams of material. We will eventually want to scale something like this up. If this were a promising molecule uh, at Purdue, we could scale it up to maybe a kilogram if we wanted to do a, a large scale blast study. Uh, but then anything larger than that, we'd want to come out here uh, and use the range out here. Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> stay away from Kinver, just stay away from his office, yes. Question here. So the question is, how sensitive is this information? All of this information has been approved for public release. So um, if bad guys got this, uh, no one would care. Okay, at least according to the Department of Defense. Okay. Well, keep an eye on, keep an eye on him. Okay. Yes, question here. Sure. So the question was, do we have to synthesize the molecule in order to know how it's going to behave? So that detonation velocity there is a calculated number. Okay. So we do a lot of, of um, modeling and simulation to get a good idea of how the molecule is going to behave, but then we come back experimentally afterwards and we validate that it does behave the way we expect it. Okay. Uh, the, the reason why, the other, so that's one reason why we have to make it. The other reason we have to make it is to see if the synthetic pathway leads us to the molecule we want through stable intermediates with a high degree of purity and, and a high yield. Okay. Other questions? This is great. I never get questions. Okay. All right. Let's keep going. Okay, so this is some of our hypergol work. Okay, so hypergols, you mix the fuel and the oxidizer, it spontaneously combusts. So these are nice, these are liquid hypergols I'm going to show you. We've got some white fuming nitric acid, and I won't tell you uh, what, the, um, what the fuel is. But when these mix, what you want is a very short time to detonation. Because, and what you would like to do with these, for example, is use them uh, to provide thrust in a rocket. Because as you feed these two liquids at different rates, now you can get combustion at different rates, and you have the ability to change the speed of a rocket. Okay? A rocket motor ordinarily is, is basically just a brick. And as the brick burns, it provides thrust. And it pretty much burns at a constant rate. So it's hard to change the speed of the projectile once it launches, right? So in this particular case, with the hypergols, we can change the rate at which we inject material, and therefore we can cause material, the, the rocket to accelerate. So I'm hoping this is going to work. If you watch down here, there's the nitric acid falling right here. So a splash. This is in milliseconds, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, and we get uh, combustion. Okay? So, that's promising, but not great. Okay? Um, so this, is, this one would be considered a failure. Okay? Uh, but the idea is to make these that come together and get to detonation or get to combustion in you know, less than a tenth of a second, tenth of a millisecond, excuse me, tenth of a millisecond. Okay? That would be fast enough that you would, you would want to, to take this to the next level. Okay? Now, the reason we call these green hypergols, in addition to the fact that they're green, is because we use ammonia boranes, um, which are more environmentally benign than many of the species that are used, the hydrazines and others that are used in a typical hypergol. So these are more appealing uh, from an environmental perspective. OK, so um, I'm hoping, let's see. Nope, OK. So one of the other things that we do is we work on formulations. So these are two different formulations. This is ammonium perchlorate in an HTPB binder, that's a typical polymeric binder, with uh, micronized aluminum inside to change the burn rate. Okay? And over here on the left, whoops, sorry about that, folks. Okay. Over here on the left, this is a classical formulation. And over here on the right, we have lithium alloyed in with the aluminum. 
uh, to provide the burn rate modification. Okay? This was the company called Adranos, which was just purchased by Anduril. This was their uh, advancement was to, to alloy in the lithium with the aluminum, and that's Purdue uh, team that came out and, and did that work. They did that work in Zucro Labs. Uh, and what you see here, these streaks coming off the top, this is molten aluminum. It's burning quickly, it gets very hot, the solid aluminum melts and gets ejected from the surface. So these are unburned metal, metal that does not contribute to the thrust, but it also is a really nice tracer to give us an idea of how fast is the burning occurring. Okay? And what you see when you look at these two is first, we've got a lot of unburned aluminum here, big blobs. We actually did the study of the size of the particles coming off, much smaller over here, so more complete utilization of the metal and coming off far faster on the right-hand side. What does that mean? That means more thrust, more power, greater acceleration, greater range. Okay? This is why the lithium aluminum alloy was such a nice enhancement to what was being done in a sort of traditional rocket motor environment. That's why, and, uh, that's why Adranos took off. That's why Adranos was successful. I apologize for that. Uh, and uh, that's why they were purchased by Anduril, and this technology was used um, by the Army in some of the longer range uh, mobile rockets that they had. Now what's interesting about this over on this side here, this is the mole fraction of hydrochloric acid created when you burn either of these materials. Okay? And up here at the top, this is what we would get if we had aluminum only, uh, about 18, uh, in some cases up to 20 percent hydrochloric acid in the gas phase as a result of burning the ammonium perchlorate. The chlorine comes from the perchlorate. When you do this in the presence of the lithium aluminum alloy, you get almost a factor of two reduction in the amount of hydrochloric acid that you form. If you happen to be the person who's on the deck of the ship and the rocket after rocket after rocket is being launched, you really like the idea that you've only got half as much hydrochloric acid in the gas phase. If you're the person who maintains all the equipment around, you're very happy with the fact the amount of hydrochloric acid has dropped. If you're on the range, you're very happy with that. So, although it might not seem like a big idea or a great, a great advancement to have less acid in the gas phase, it actually is, is a substantial benefit. So there's not only a performance benefit, but also a process benefit to using this new material. Well, so the question was about the cost. Uh, it's more expensive to go with the lithium aluminum alloy. Um, it is, however, a drop-in. Okay. So the process itself doesn't have to be retooled. Okay. And the reason it's a little bit more expensive is coating the lithium so that you can handle it in a micron, a micron size scale powder uh, is uh, tricky. Okay. It doesn't like to be exposed to air. If you've seen lithium batteries, they burn beautifully, right? So you have to find a way to protect the lithium powder as you put it into the alloy, and that causes this to be a little bit more expensive. But the performance more than outweighs. The performance more than outweighs, yes. Yes, that's correct. Okay, let's keep going. All right, so uh, we want to work on conductive binders, right? The binder, right now, the binder just comes along for the ride, right? The binder holds everything together, comes along for the ride, and doesn't do very much otherwise, okay? But if the, if the binder were conductive, you could apply an electrical potential, and maybe you could cause things to heat up. You could apply a potential, and you might be able to cause materials to change from one state to another state. You might be able to actuate a trigger if the material was sitting in a warehouse for 25 years, you might be able to apply an electrical potential. And if it's conductive, you could see if the composition has changed. So now you have a way to check the aging of the material inside the rocket or the missile without having to cut it open. And as you know, once you cut it open, it's not, not any good anymore, right? So this would be very valuable for a number of different reasons. And what you see here, um, this, is, uh, this has not burned. We had an electrical lead here, an electrical lead here. And this is a uh, um, PTEO, uh, it's a um, polyethylene oxide based polymer and it conducts electricity along its backbone by radicals and not by ions. And what we want is we want uniform heating between the electrical leads, which is what we get, and no burning, which is also what we got. Okay, so we apply a current right there and the material heated up, heated up, heated up and melted right along that line, nice and uniform. What that means is when we use this as a binder in a real application, now when we apply a potential, we can get uniform heating, uniform conduction. No spontaneous combustion any place inside the polymer. And you can see down here, we started loading this material. 
with, in this case, sugar, and in this place, in this case, RDX, so we can process it and turn it into a working composite energetic material. We also characterize the mechanical properties over here, and we can change those mechanical properties depending on the extent of cross-linking of the polymer that we make. So if we need the energetic compound to be more rigid, we can make it more rigid. If we need it to be more flexible, we can make it more flexible. Okay? So that's the appeal of using these kinds of molecules. Questions? Okay. All right, so this is the most exciting slide I'm going to show you, uh, which is because it's my work. And now that I've introduced it that way, it is actually the most boring slide I'm going to show you. Uh, but hang in here with me. This is all about the adhesion of the energetic species. If we want uh, uh, different kinds of ordinates to be able to accelerate and hang together, not tear itself apart by the force of acceleration, we need to make sure the adhesion of the material inside is as strong as possible or as, as good as possible. And so this is a way to evaluate that. This over here is essentially the um, adhesion constant or the, it's an indirect measure of the strength of adhesion of the materials inside an energetic composite as a function of the size of the material. And so what we can do here and what we've done, this is glass, doesn't adhere very well, and this is PDMS, which is a rubbery binder that's occasionally used in energetic materials. And you can see now here's ammonium perchlorate, which is in our rocket motors, here's HMX and RDX. And so we can evaluate and measure very precisely the adhesion between the energetic powders and the binder materials over a wide range of energetic powder sizes. Then we can go back and now we can change the chemical composition of the binder to, to tune that adhesion, make it adhere better, make it adhere less. Okay. And so that's the purpose of this work, is just to demonstrate a way to measure the behavior of all the different materials that we're making before we put them in a device. Wasn't that exciting? Thank you. All right. Nobody likes my stuff. Nobody ever likes my stuff. Okay, so over here, uh, this is some 3D printing work I'm going to tell you about now. So this is some ammonium perchlorate-based propellant, and you know we can burn it, and lots of other people can burn it. Uh, and then over here, we've mixed a little bit of alumina in there, and you see the burn rate is modified. You see that material raining off the surface. Okay, that's just fine. Now over here, what we're doing is we're 3D printing this kind of material, and now we can measure the burn rate in very small quantities. We mentioned earlier over here, I think, milligram quantities, okay, which is what we're show showing here. But then we can also take the material and we can put it in a rocket, like down here, and we can measure the behavior in a rocket motor. So measure the thrust when, it's, when it's, we've got a large amount of material. So we want to be able to do that to evaluate different behaviors of different materials that we make using an additive manufacturing uh, type approach. So here at the top, what we're doing is we're making energetic ink. Uh, and so these are uh, two electrical contacts. We apply a potential across, and this spontaneously uh, deflagrates or detonates depending on the composition of the energetic ink. That allows us to, to put energy exactly where we want it with about 10 micron precision. So if, for example, you wanted to destroy a sensitive part on a computer chip selectively, you could print this ink on that chip and exactly what you want to disappear would disappear when you apply a potential. Okay? If you want to print a trigger or print any kind of uh, actuating, actuatable device, inside a munition. You could print it with this kind of energetic ink. This down here is, is the same filament-based printing that a lot of folks can do. What's interesting about what we do here is we can print very high solids loaded material, basically material that's ready to go into uh, an ordinance. In this case, we printed the P. This is aluminum Teflon mix is representative of a rocket motor type material, and that burned really, really well. I don't understand why we didn't print the IU or or the Ohio State logo, we always print the Purdue logo and then we burn it. Uh, but this is what's really the most exciting stuff. This is fully dense energetic material. So this is greater than 85% solids loaded energetic material, exactly what you would find in, in many different uh, types of ordnance that are formulated in a traditional fashion. This stuff has the viscosity of modeling clay. Okay. So we've developed a proprietary technique for taking this kind of material and shoving it through an inkjet printer head and we can print with 10 to 20 micron scale accuracy lines of fully dense energetic material, which gives us the ability to then print structural energetics. So we printed a vehicle out of energetic material, which moved from here to someplace else, and all of it was made from energetic material. So that means the drone, for example, could be made completely from energetic material. 
which is an interesting sort of advance to think about. Right now, all of those structural components you're used to seeing in those kinds of devices do nothing except carry along the energetic material that's eventually going to be the explosive. Okay. The whole vehicle could be, and we've developed that technology at Purdue. No questions. Okay. So, yeah, there was a question. I figured there would be. Yes? Sorry. So the question is, how does humidity affect the material over time? So, it's not. Once the material is, is cast or printed and cured, humidity is irrelevant. Okay. Humidity does matter during the processing of the material before it's printed. Okay, and you, we've control that variable when we're processing the material and when we're printing the material. Okay, it's not that difficult to do, um, but it does make a difference during that stage of the overall process. But once it's cured, it's irrelevant. Yeah. Uh, yes, um, the stability of 3D printed ink, uh, it's no less stable than a, a traditionally processed um, alternative material. Uh, the same is true of the, of the 3D printed composite stuff, um, the structural material. Um, and, and that's important to us because we're the ones running it through the printer, right? Um, and so we want it to be just as insensitive as a traditional material would be, and it, it turns out to be that way. Okay. Everything, I, I should point out, everything we do, we operate remotely. Okay? Um, that way, if there were to be an accident, there's no, there's no people who are going to be harmed. Uh, but it, it's no less sensitive than a t traditional material. Uh-huh. Oh, so, so the question is, uh, so if I printed a drone and somebody's going to carry it in theater, how do you ignite it? Well, you would, you would print triggers. You would embed electrical circuits inside, uh, and then you would uh, cause it to do whatever it's going to do the same way you would with a traditional ordinance. The only difference is now you can make a lot of the structural materials out of the energetic. Question was here? These are printed high explosives. Yes, these are printed high explosives. Yes. The question was, are these printed high explosives? The answer was yes. Okay. Uh, not too high because we want to be safe, um, but we've printed materials that are more than exciting enough. Oh. So right here is an example of what we do with that. So these are just computer chips, and I'm going to show you that we can break a computer chip. And, that's not all that impressive, but what I want you to be impressed by is where this number phi down here at the bottom, this is the fuel to oxidizer ratio in a thermite. Okay. So we're printing thermite here with 20 micron or so resolution. And by changing the fuel to oxidizer ratio, we can go from the optimal ratio to a really not very optimal ratio. And what we should see is when this stuff burns, it's going to give off different amounts of energy. From our perspective, why that matters is because it means we can control the energy release. So sometimes we need a lot of energy, we can have a lot of energy. Sometimes we want very little, we can have very little. We can do it exactly where we want. So you watch the video, what you're going to see is up here, where the fuel to oxidizer ratio is excellent, we completely obliterate that, that computer chip just by printing basically a small little puddle of this stuff. Uh, but down here where the fuel to oxidizer ratio is not optimal, we're just going to dislodge that from its mooring. Okay? So you can watch now and hopefully you'll enjoy this. Here we go. Boom up there, completely obliterate it, crack it in half down here, just knock it over there, and break it into a few pieces here. Okay? So being able to control energy release rate and control the intensity of the release is a big deal. And so demonstrating sort of the ability to do that here. Okay, so this is some uh, additively manufactured material. This is Monique McLean. Uh, she is uh, our youngest faculty member, not our newest, but our youngest faculty member. She was just named to the top 35 scientists under the age of 35 in the country by Technology Review, and I'm very proud of that. Uh, Monique is fantastic. Um, and so here, what she's doing is she's printing, this is an ammonium perchlorate-based material. This is the same material, but now it's embedded with iron oxide, and then ammonium perchlorate again. And you see this is millimeter, uh, millimeter length scale-ish material that she's printing. Okay. And what you see over here, you see the dark regions, these stripes, okay. that is where she's printed the uh, iron oxide impregnated material. 
And in the burn rate studies, you see that always burns faster. Okay, you can see that, right? It's always shaped like a V going down, that iron oxide material is burning faster than the material that doesn't have the iron oxide present. So this gives us the ability to, with great precision, control the burn rate in a rocket motor or in any other kind of structure by choosing the materials that we print and where we lay them out. And this is one of the newest contributions to what I show you today. So this is conductive ink that we printed over the top of energetic material. And what we want to do is, can we print a heater and put that inside, uh, for example, an energetic uh, formulation? Can we print an antenna? Can we print some other type of actuator, like a strain gauge? In this case, these are heaters. And uh, we uh, printed, with, these are different particle sizes for the material inside what we printed. And you, we were able to go up to very high temperatures um, by printing these conductive materials on top of energetic compounds. Now, uh, this is a chip of ammonium perchlorate in Silgard. Silgard is the rubbery stuff that you use to seal around your windows. Okay? And it, that Silgard is epoxied on to the emitter from a cell phone down here. Okay? And so with less than 10 watts of power, we can drive that ammonium perchlorate in milliseconds to deflagrate. which is a big deal if you imagine that a rocket or a missile might vibrate when it flies or when it's attached to an aircraft. Okay? And uh, so we've discovered this, and now that we realize that this can happen, of course the challenge is to make it not happen. Right? Uh, and so what that does is it, it gives us the opportunity and the reason to engineer the interface where the, between the energetic crystal and the binder or between the binder and whatever kind of casing we have to try to find a way to disperse the energy before it can get into that interstitial zone and cause the energetic material to deflagrate. Right? You want the rocket to fly and to burn its fuel, not to fizzle out because it was shaking on the aircraft. And so that's the work we're doing. And down here in the bottom left, this is the exact same system, but now instead of the excellent coupling between the binder and the substrate, we have that ultrasound gel like if you ever had an ultrasound on your knee or uh, an ultrasound for looking at a, uh, um, a fetus, right? That's this, that same material. So we've decoupled the energy input from the binder. And instead of going to deflagration in milliseconds, we heat it up by two degrees over the course of 15 seconds. Okay? So very effectively able to minimize the energy transport and then minimize the deleterious effects on the energetic material. She says, I'm doing good, so I'm going to keep going. OK, uh, this is our work on continuous crystallization. And you can't see it from where you are. But here, you have to imagine, this is like a string of pearls. Okay? So these are all spherical chambers, like, like golf balls on a string. And what we do is we feed in, right, right now, when we make energetic materials, we want to crystallize them. We might crystallize 500 gallons of material. And we make great big crystals. They all clunk out at once. Then we take a look, and hopefully we got what we wanted. Then we dissolve it, do it all over again, and then grind up the crystals that we make, and that goes on to further processing. Okay? It's a very inefficient way to do it. Okay? We don't find out until we've tried 500 gallons of material that we got the wrong stuff. Okay? What we'd rather do is process this continuously. So you have continuously flowing mother liquor going through something like this, coming out the top with all of the energetic crystals that you want, exactly the right size, exactly the right shape, exactly the right crystal habit. And that's what we do. In every single one of these little golf ball chambers, there's a little bit of dissolution of the crystals and a little bit of solidification. A little dissolution, a little bit of growth. Dissolution, growth. All the way up and through, and out the top comes the material that we want. The size we want, the shape we want, crystal habit that we want. And you sort of see that right here. In this particular case, what we wanted to do was make a trimodal distribution of crystal sizes. So some big crystals over here that were on the order of 700 microns, some here on the order of 500 microns, and some down here about 250 microns. Okay. The blue is, let me look at that real quick. The blue is the crystal size distribution that we want. The red is what our simulation tells us we're going to get when we operate this equipment. The black is the seed crystal distribution we have to put in in order to get the desired output. And I'm not showing you the all of the work in here that gives us the performance that we see here in the red. Okay. 
So this gives us, if, if you want to go to continuous manufacturing of energetic materials, which is what we want to do. We make every product you care about, all of them, we do continuous manufacturing to make it. Your glasses, milk, mo uh, eight of your medicines now, uh, the material in your shoes, the material in the carpet, the material in this thing, all of it is made continuous mode manufacturing. Raw materials come in, continuously through a process, out the other end. 24-7 operation, quality by control. If all the dials are where they're supposed to be, the material coming out the end has the purity and the, it is exactly what you want. Okay? The only things we don't make that way are energetic materials, cookies, and about half of the pharmaceuticals that you, that you use right now. Purdue led the revolution that transformed the pharmaceutical industry from batch mode manufacturing to continuous mode, which is why there's nine drugs you can take right now that are made by continuous mode. That meant teaching the FDA to do quality by control, where are all the dials, versus quality by testing. Okay. We're trying to lead that same revolution for the energetic materials community, because the quality goes way up, our ability to produce material rapidly because we have to surge uh, goes way up. Okay. And then our costs, of course, go way down, and we can take people out of the process. If, if most factories have very, very few operators in them, and we want to do the same thing for the energetic materials. And so this capability, this ability to design what we want, operate it, make sure we've got the temperature where we want, the composition of the solvent where we want, the flow rate where we want, and get the product that we want without having to go through the testing is exactly what we want to do. All right, so this is some IR work that we're doing. We want to be able to look at a fireball and see what's going on inside. Sometimes you want to cause an explosion and you want that energy to stay in place because you want to consume all of the chemical weapons in a chemical weapons facility. Sometimes that's not all that important. Sometimes you want energy to, to spread rapidly because you want to maybe push a building down or maybe you want to direct some material in a certain direction. In order to be able to engineer that fireball, you have to know what's going on inside. So in this particular case, we're using two different lasers piggybacked over each other, and we send that through the fireball, and then measure the change in the intensity of the light when it comes out. That allows us to understand how energy is released in the fireball, lets us understand what the composition is in the fireball. Then we can come back and en engineer the material that created the fireball. So this is a detonation chamber. We got a laser coming, we got the light coming in here, the laser coming in here. We're gonna make a little boom in there. We slow it way down for you. Um, oh, whoops, hold on. You want to see that, so maybe we just do, no, help me, help me, let's go one more, okay, let's try it again, nope, it's, it's too far, here we go, all right, no, let's back up just one. I'm so sorry, I don't know why that, that is not working. Let me try one more thing. I want to show you this so you believe me that we're actually seeing something. There we go. How come I don't see that? All right, so here we're going to have a boom, boom. Okay, a lot of work to show you that, but boom. Okay, I was bound and determined. I brought that darn thing here. I was going to make you look at it. Okay, so um, we are shining a laser through that fireball, right? Now, ordinarily in a fireball, you lose a ton of light because there's a lot of soot and a lot of solids inside there. You usually lose many orders of magnitude, eight, nine orders of magnitude of signal as you pass through the fireball. One of those lasers is designed to penetrate the fireball and it carries along the other signal. So now we can get a lot of information out of the fireball. And what we're doing here in the bottom is we're predicting, we're measuring the temperature as a function of time in the fireball in milliseconds. So we can measure about a 2,000 degree change in temperature in about 15 milliseconds uh, this way. And we can tell the difference between the temperature profile in the fireball when we've got HMX with micronized aluminum present versus when we've got HMX all by itself. Okay. So now we have ability to relate the composition of the material that's detonating with the temperature, that, the heat that's given off during the detonation. That allows us to come back and engineer the fireball to perform the way we want it to perform. I'm going to show you a bunch more of these kinds of examples. Here we're using the laser to understand. This is um, HMX that we're burning right now, so we're just looking at temperature right now. Here we can get temperature, and by looking at the intensity of light at different wavelengths, we can get composition in the flame. That allows us to get composition now and temperature in, for example, 
the exhaust from a rocket. Now we can better understand how to engineer the fireball. A little bit farther, this is a detonator up here. This is in nanoseconds, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. So with nanosecond precision, we can look at where all the solids go. And so these are x-ray studies. So now what we can do is we can figure out where are all the solids going, we can figure out what are their composition, we can figure out what temperature do they have. Now we can really understand what's going on inside a fireball as a function of what did we put in there before we made the boom happen. And down here you see we're working with some spray cans. What's interesting here is being able to track the three-dimensional distribution in space over time of where are all the particles going. And we can, if we decide we want to use a little bit of interesting light, we can get information about the composition inside uh, a post-detonation fireball. We can look at where all the soot is. This is some work actually from uh, a wind tunnel. Um, it was not the Mach 8 wind tunnel, but it was, uh, I'm not going to take a guess. I can't remember. It was not the newest wind tunnel that we have, one of the older ones. But what was interesting is we can see where the turbulence is, and in this case we're tracking fluorescence. We can see what the composition is inside the material that's trailing uh, inside the wind tunnel. Now this is some of the newest work that we have. This is Dan Gildenbesher. He is our newest uh, faculty colleague. He just joined us from Sandia where he was a distinguished scientist. And he does a lot of work that's very similar to what I just showed you in terms of tracking in multiple dimensions where all the solids go as a function of detonation conditions. Because we're really interested in understanding how material detonates where the energy goes, where the solids go, so we can engineer the fireballs. So in this particular case down here, these are munitions detonating, and he's tracking where all the solids go, tracking the size of the different solids that are created, looking at how the interface moves, tracking where all of the solid particles are, following them in space, and being able to know it's that particle, it's that particle, it's that particle. So that seems not so exciting when I do it right now with my finger, but he's doing it in a fireball, following a detonation tracking all of them. Okay. Uh, over here is, is simulation. Whoops. Ah, darn it. All right, we'll just go to this. Okay, so here he is tracking individual particles as they're spit off of the surface. And here is the reconstruction of the motion of those particles in three dimensions, tracking size of the particles uh, as a function of the detonation conditions, as a function of the temperature inside the system. So really trying to understand what's going on following a detonation. This is also useful if something went boom over there and you want to know what happened. Um, you don't necessarily want to be there to figure that out. You want to be able to tell from a distance. And this information is useful for telling what happened over there when there was that, that explosion. So here's some more work sort of demonstrating the capability. Um, we're showing here energy release. We're showing particles moving away from a surface, a hydrocode is a certain kind of model that's used to describe materials flowing under very high pressures and temperatures very rapidly. Um, but the important thing for you is just tracking, oh darn it, just tracking where all the particles are. And so here's some more of that kind of work here. We're actually simulating, you know, the, the curls that you see around a flame, simulating where those are and comparing them to observation. Okay. Now, sometimes we want to be able to handle an energetic material and know how it's going to behave without handling live energetic. And so this is some work to make simulated energetic material. And here we're looking at the fracture toughness. So we hit it with a little point, pointy object and we measure how much force it takes to indent a certain depth. And what's interesting here is the adoxyuridine is a common simulant for HMX. And at low loads, uh, it, it cracks or it behaves mechanically very similar to the HMX. At very high loads, again, it's very similar. But in between, at a lot of the loads that we would encounter in real life, it's a terrible surrogate. Okay? So you need to know that so you can develop mechanical processes with materials that are safe. Once you understand how the materials behave using safe surrogates, then you can use live stuff. Okay. Here's some work on, on looking at how defects change burning rates and detonations. So we drill a hole in, a, in this energetic material, and then we over here, we're measuring how the, the uh, flame front leaps ahead of the burning front here, leaps ahead through the defect, and we can simulate that as well over on this side. So again, theory and experiment coming together. All right, so over here is what I want to show you now. These are gas guns. This is 
very high speed projectiles, hundreds of meters per second, uh, crashing into different materials. And over here, this is an HMX crystal in a rubbery binder, and we put that in the gas gun inside the particle accelerator at Argonne. The left, we're just crushing glass beads to show you what happens under high rate impact. And so sure enough, things, go, things get crushed, right? But over here on the right, we're gonna see that happen with this HMX crystal. The impact is gonna come from the left. And what you're gonna see is initially there's a little bit of compression. Then it looks like some liquefaction around the outside edge of that crystal. Then the material swells because it's hot, and now it starts to get consumed, it collapses upon itself and deflagrates. So you're watching the material go from a solid to spontaneously burning itself out using x-rays in the particle accelerator at Argonne. We're the only group in the world that does that. So now we're getting into manufacturing, and what we're doing is simulating at multiple scales. So we want to be able to simulate individual processes, then simulate how that process behaves when we put it in different places around the country, and then put it into a large-scale model and optimize the supply chain, the production of all the raw materials, the production of all the intermediates, the production of the final materials to try to come up with a strategy for optimizing manufacturing. And then this is a facility that we've designed that we hope to install at Purdue. Uh, and in this one, this is fully continuous energetics manufacturing. So you start over here with raw materials, those go into different types of reactors where we have reactions to form energetic crystals, those go into a continuous crystallization apparatus, continuous filtration and drying, up and then into a continuous formulation, continuous mixing process, and out the end comes a ribbon of energetic material that you could put into ordnance. All of it operated remotely, uh, all of it controlled using process design, process control algorithms, not by testing. And this is actually a design of the building that we are hoping to construct. Uh, and each of these is a blast cell. So in each of these different blast cells, we can have the reactors that we want, plumb through the wall to the next reactor, plumb through the wall to the crystallizer, plumb through the wall to the mixer. We want a different mixer, wheel one out, wheel a new one in. Okay? So we can simulate many different kinds of chemical plants, hang them all together, and do not only the manufacturing, but also all the optimization and design. And congratulations, you made it through the whole thing. So that's what we do, molecules to manufacturing. We've got roughly 150 people working on energetic materials at any given time across chemical engineering, mechanical engineering, aeronautical engineering, materials engineering, chemistry, and math. And it was a pleasure to be here to tell you about it. I appreciated the questions. If I have time, I'll take more questions. And if not, I'll invite you to join me for a beverage. But we'll try questions first. Yes. So the question was, there's a lot of material that's been sent to Ukraine recently, uh, and so now we have supply chain concerns because we want to be able to restock our arsenal rather quickly. And it's true that uh, over the last few decades, we have slowly offshored the manufacturing of many of the key materials or key intermediates that ultimately end up in our arsenal. And so there's a very large effort across the uh, departments of energy and defense to onshore the manufacturing of everything in that supply chain. And this work that I showed you is the development of the manufacturing processes that are at the heart of that onshoring. Okay. The simulations I showed you of supply chain talk about what kinds of risks are associated with sourcing different materials at different parts of the country, assembling those materials at different parts of the country or in different friendly shores, and trying to find a way to optimize the delivery of all the materials to the final manufacturing site. So, a long answer to your question. The, the question was, are we trying to address supply chain and the ability to restock quickly? And the answer is yes, that's exactly what we're doing. Back there, yes? So the question was, I was surprised to see RDX. That was a World War II era product. It's still the main product? And the answer is yes. Yeah, it's still the dominant uh, energetic material in most applications. Over here, yep. Yeah. 
So the question was, you know, we can design burn rate, for example, in a rocket uh, by the way that we assemble the rocket motor, right? By the composition of the rocket motor, the way it's put together. And that gives us, to some degree, the ability to, to control burn rate. And so the question is, is there a possibility of engineering materials so that we can control the burn rate uh, in theater while we're using it, right? So when I was talking to you about the conductive binder materials, uh, by applying a potential to those materials, we can change local temperature and we can cause burn rate to speed up or slow down. So the idea behind the conductive binder work was to be able to offer some degree of tunability to burn rate. The same is true with the hypergals. Way back there, yes? Sure. So the question was about the value associated with continuous manufacturing versus batch mode manufacturing that we do right now. Uh, the, the two areas where it makes the most impact, number one, it lets you take people away from the process, okay, which is valuable. Number two, you find out about problems as they are occurring and you can kick the process back rather than finding out about the problem after you've made a bunch of something and now you have to go and test it and realize that this isn't what we wanted. So it cuts down on the amount of waste. It also lets you use, because you can operate continuously, it lets you operate uh, in smaller facilities and still be able to generate the amount of material that you want. Okay. So rather than having one large plant and something goes wrong there and we have nothing, you can have many smaller plants that could provide more output than the one large plant. Um, and now you have a lot more flexibility, you have the ability to be nimble in your manufacturing, make different products and search. So those are the main advantages. When, when, I'll, I'll elaborate because I love this question. Um, when pharma went to continuous mode manufacturing, uh, the very first efforts, they way overbuilt because they didn't fully appreciate the value in terms of how much material they could generate when they were operating 24-7, 365. Okay? So the facilities were built too large uh, and now scaled back um, so that the production rate can meet demand more appropriately. Question here. <laughs> the question was the timeline when the concept was introduced to pharma of moving to continuous mode manufacturing versus when it started happening. It's on the order of a decade. On the order of. Okay. I was part of the team when the first proposals were written and funded to sort of explore it. And the center that did that work ran a full 10 years, and now it's been two years since then. And now there's nine molecules you can buy that way. So that went from idea to installed manufacturing capability and production, about a decade. We need to do this faster, but we've already done it once. Wait, other than, I always get in trouble if I speculate. The idea is, could you speculate? Uh, so, Making pharmaceuticals is very similar to making energetic materials. Energetic materials are just more exciting. But they're very similar, right? Uh, if you talk about an, uh, an aspirin in your hand, what is it? Well, it was a powder. It had a bunch of active ingredients in powder form. It has a bunch of materials that are in there just to make everything stick together. And you squeeze it together real tight and it makes a tablet. Okay? That's not all that different from a lot of the press molded energetic materials that we use. So a lot of the processes are very similar. What took the pharma industry a long time was developing the processes to handle the powders and measure the flow rates of the powders and do everything we had to do with all of these solids type products. Now that we've done that, I would expect what we're going to do with energetic materials to go faster. Uh, we'll be slowed down by the fact that you have to be more careful. Um, but we do have the advantage of having done this for one industry already and found a lot of the problems the hard way there. So I would expect it will be faster. I don't know how much faster. I think we might have worn everybody out. Okay. Let's give a hand to Professor Bowden. Bowden. Thank you. Thank you. He, is, he not, is he not so smart, or am I just really stupid? He's, 
You're a very smart guy, very smart guy. So, so we're lucky to have you in our corner to continue that research, so we appreciate that. Um, and I don't know about you, but I think we should get him to sign some sort of a certificate of completion of energetics research, don't you, since we've attended this seminar here. So <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, we also want to thank Lidos for, for sponsoring the food and drink outside. Cedar Hill Catering provided the food so uh, and the drinks, so we want you to enjoy your time. Uh, a lot of great questions, so we want those questions to continue outside in the, in the lobby. Um, if you want to go to our website at westgate-academy.com, you can see all of our past and future events that are going to happen on the first Tuesdays. We're always doing something within the different space that NSWC Crane and the defense contractors are, are leaning towards. So again, we want to thank you for attending. Uh, it was great attendance tonight. Thank you very much for coming all this way, three, three hour, three and a half hour drive. So everybody enjoy themselves and have more conversation out there. Thank you. <laughs>